This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus three months for free. Hey everyone. This is gonna be a bit of a weird video. For the past while, I've been doing a series where I've been watching and making fun of bad reality TV and using it as a bit of a jumping off point to talk about politics and sociology. That's kind of what I'm doing today, but the show I'm going to be talking about is a little bit different than my usual stuff. So one of the weird things I didn't expect from doing this series is that people have been sending me shows that are way too bad for me to cover. Like, someone sent me a show from the 2000s called Solitary, where the idea is that contestants are kept in solitary confinement, assigned a number which serves as their name for the entirety of the show. Your old selves, your old identities, mean nothing here. In Solitary, your name is your number and then are subjected to competitions like being woken up from one of the rare times when they're actually allowed to sleep and then made to answer questions like how long they think that they were out for. I am curious to observe my guests' behavior when their body clocks are thrown out of balance. How was your sleep? Please listen carefully. I want you to tell me how long you think you were sleeping. Three hours, 20 minutes. Two hours. And while I do absolutely appreciate all the suggestions that I get, the problem with this is that there's not really any commentary I can add about a show that the UN would unambiguously classify as a war crime. All I'm asking for is just a little bit of subtlety. Let me be the one who makes the case that what's happening is torture. Don't just make that the whole pitch of your show. And so I've tried to stay away from shows like these, but this month I accidentally stumbled onto one that's unbelievably messed up. And so in this video, I'm going to talk about a show called Lost Resort. The premise is that people with mental health problems stemming from traumatic experiences are sent on a new age retreat where, under the guidance of a team of healers, they confront their issues and are ultimately cured. Now, I was expecting a bunch of weird hippie bullshit along with people unironically calling themselves empaths, and don't worry, that's all there. As an empath, I'm deeply upset. Is it my responsibility because I'm empathic? But as an empath sitting in such close quarters with everyone? I've always been able to connect with people immediately. At 12 years old, I went door to door. I sold 500 boxes of candy. These are empath problems. Also, I'm aware that that description may have rung a couple alarm bells for some of you. First of all, the show pretty explicitly says that all mental health problems are caused by childhood trauma, usually just a singular event, which is flat out not true. Mental health is obviously a very complex thing that's affected by all sorts of factors ranging from your brain chemistry to your genetics to your physical health to your environment, as well as, yes, your childhood. It's also a bit of a red flag when people think that mental health problems can just be conclusively cured, let alone saying that that can happen over the course of just one month. But if that was the worst thing about this, Lost Resort would be a very different show. This is honestly the most evil thing I think I've ever watched for this channel, which, if you're familiar with my stuff, is kind of saying something. Some of the ways the people on this show are treated, who, again, are there to receive therapy, are genuinely horrifying, and if seeing people with, in some cases, very serious traumas being mistreated and exploited is going to ruin your day, I would suggest just skipping this video. One of the weirdest things, just from the start, is how hard it is to categorize Lost Resort. It's sold as a sort of self-improvement show in the same vein as Queer Eye, but from a New Age spirituality angle. Except it's also kind of a trashy drama show, since while one of the producers is a New Age healer who also hosts the show named Chrissy Fire Main, seen here wearing her favorite hat that makes her look like an evil cowboy who won't shut up about Burning Man, <laughs> 
She dresses like Johnny Depp in The Lone Ranger, except if the movie was about a white woman who heroically calls the cops on some black kids. But the rest of the producers come from the world of more traditional, trash reality TV, producing shows like The Real Housewives of New Jersey and A Shot of Love with Tila Tequila, which is why we get stuff like this. The fact that you wouldn't just automatically go, no, bro, you're my friend. I'm not going to come back to your room. Why are you going to go back to his bedroom after everybody else is asleep? You might be innocent and not see it. But then there's also sort of a survivor type challenge aspect as the guests on the show who thought that they were going to be on hippie queer eye instead find themselves in what quickly becomes a new age cult and the camera crews just keep rolling. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get into what actually happens and the way that this show that already seems set up to delight in exploiting vulnerable people spiraled completely out of control in some really dark ways. Right after I tell you about this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Folks, let's be frank here. Netflix may be dying, but you know what's never been stronger? The ancient god who me and my fellow aspirants are endeavoring to resurrect to put an end to this wretched age of man. Except, uh-oh. <sighs> Great. Thanks to the interference of those cursed interlopers, the YouTube channel where I watch my daily blood ceremonies can now only be viewed in... the imaginary country that Dark Souls was set in? That's where a VPN comes in. Surfshark allows you to connect to the internet from anywhere in the world, tricking streaming sites and allowing you to watch region-locked content. And now, nothing can stop us from completing the ritual. Also, and this is something that I just found out about that's kind of wild. Now that people are traveling again, something that you may not know is that a lot of hotels will change their prices depending on where you are when you book them, charging international travelers way more than locals. With Surfshark, you can get a way cheaper rate by tricking hotels into thinking that you're already in the city that you want to book a room in. And so if, like me, you're traveling to Lordran upon the coming of the next false moon, then if you click the link in the description, go to surfshark.deal slash we're in hell, or use the promo code we're in hell at checkout, all one word, no apostrophe, you'll be able to get Surfshark for 83% off for two years, plus an additional three months for free, allowing you to get a great deal on your hotel while we welcome in the dawn of the Age of Tears. Anyways, back to talking about a bunch of new age weirdos. Okay, so Lost Resort was filmed over a month and takes place at a yoga retreat in Costa Rica. It features eight guests who all have some issue that they're trying to deal with. The issues all vary in severity, but all of them are things that these people really should be in therapy for. And while some types of alternative new age medicine can, I assume, be really helpful for some people, and I'm absolutely not an expert in this, 
I feel pretty safe saying that these people were not getting the help they needed here, owing both to the healers who were leading the retreat, who we'll meet very soon, as well as the fact that this was a fucking reality show. Now, let's meet the guests on the show. First, we have Robin and her daughter, Christine. These two have a ridiculously dysfunctional relationship. They're always fighting while the other guests go back and forth between which one they like and which one they are ridiculously mean to. It comes off very fake. It comes off like you want attention. And Christine's going to bring... always walk away and run away like it's somebody else's fault when she can't deal with it herself. They wind up having to be roommates with this guy, Greg, and he just has to listen to them constantly fighting. What are you talking about? Do you want me to have the standard of loving my body? You don't love your body either, Christine. Then there's Claudia, who is awesome. <laughs> She winds up staying with definitely the two best people on the show, Miko and Becca, and it's absolute chaos. I'm uh, getting spanked with the <laughs> my <laughs> with your legs up here, and he's right here, and he's spanking your <laughs> and you just <laughs> wow, okay. Also, Miko and Becca become really good friends, and it's unbelievably cute. Ready? In the back, go. <laughs> and then go side to side, <laughs> okay. then bring it down. <laughs> she airing out. Don't worry about her. Girl, you good? Make sure you all right. I'll see you later, boo. <laughs> I love that you name them. That's hilarious. So you lean to the side. I'm learning how to twerk. Okay, come on, come on. It, it, it. Then you give a little smack. That's intense. <laughs> then there's Thea, who's there because she's having troubles with her marriage. Me and my husband Brandon have been going through marital issues. I am hopeful that going on this retreat will help save our marriage. I want to be able to love him the way he loves me. And Veron, a firefighter who, for his job, needs to be able to turn off his emotions, but now can't really turn them back on in his personal life. I am a full-time firefighter EMT. Having to witness the worst days of somebody's life, I have to kind of shut down emotion. Coming home and having to turn the emotions back on. Now, this show would kind of just be generically bad, but it's so much darker when you bear in mind the seriousness of what these people are there to deal with. There are parts where the guests act really weirdly or get into ridiculous fights, and it's funny and absurd until you remember that these people are essentially supposed to be patients receiving therapy. Also, all of the guests talk about being really hungry, like, all the time. I want this. I'm tired of eating this bullshit. I don't know if I can eat another raw vegetable today. I'm just, I feel like I've just been so hungry since we got here. Like, always hungry. I think that most of the food they got was just raw fruits and vegetables. On the sixth night, they sit down to dinner and are unbelievably happy when they see that they're getting guacamole. Is that guacamole? Oh, <gasps> yes! This is the best meal by far. I think because that was probably one of the first times they'd eaten anything with much fat in it in almost a week. That said, while they're constantly hungry, they also get absolutely wasted every night, and you can even see in a couple shots that they're drinking wine throughout the whole day. And so, I'm gonna go over a lot of stuff that happens during the show, and some of it is ridiculous, but while they regularly chastise the guests for being too dramatic, it's important to keep in mind that they're all in an extremely vulnerable position, psychologically raw, starving, and probably drunk, on top of the already fucked up cult nature of a reality TV show. Before we do that though, let's meet all of the healers. While Chrissy is in charge, she has a team of other people who help her run the retreat and lead various activities. The first of these is Atasie, who is a little weird. What origin is that? It's an angelic name. In 1998, I was given the spiritual name Atasie. It was whispered softly over and over again in my ear by my guardian angelic presence. Yeah, if my therapist told me he'd changed his name because his guardian angel told him to, I'd have some follow-up questions. Like, what do angels really look like? What was wrong with his human name? Do I still have to pay for this session if I leave now and never come back? On the show, he mostly leads everyone in activities involving dancing, and very funny thing with him is that sometimes when he's talking, there'll be just like a gust of wind or something, and he'll use that as evidence that he's right about whatever he's talking about. I have the opinion that we 
Oh, oh. Hella. Whoa. Well, maybe you were right. If I'm somewhere, there's energy moving in the space with me that they might not understand or know. At one point, there's a small earthquake while he's talking, and he fully claims that he caused it. To waste precious freaking time and energy That's on fine. some BS. What's that? <gasps> I'm out. It wasn't that I intended to cause the earthquake, but as the earth is shaking, I'm feeling like she's working with us to clear the energy in the space. Probably the worst thing about Atasie, though, is that he's actually the most reasonable healer on the show. <laughs> like, we're only going downhill from here. When the guy who literally believes that he controls the weather is the only one making any sense, that's not a good place to be in. Next we have Onika, who is also really cool and probably the only person there who's in any way legit. I teach yoga, meditation, massage, Reiki. I teach to folks who are in jail in New York. I have a specialty in trauma sensitivity. Unfortunately, Onika barely says a word throughout the entire show and only actually even shows up in six out of the ten episodes. Then there's Ben, who's Literally just a fitness influencer who teaches yoga. <laughs> it's probably good that he doesn't do very much since he's just a massive himbo whenever he talks. Your body is your temple. I was blessed to have a temple that's six foot four and has nice hair and develops muscles well when I put the practice in. According to Native American totem and my birth date, I'm a sea otter. Feels pretty good. Now, these healers all play a way bigger role in this than you would probably think. A regular part of the show is healer meetings where they all discuss the guests and their problems. I actually stopped Christina from starting to talk about Robin a lot. It's a way to perpetuate a drama that brings attention. I can see that Miko has not been loved. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but it feels pretty weird seeing them gossiping about all the guests, considering that these people are supposed to be their patients. On the other hand, though, maybe I'm just stuck in my preconceived notions about Western medicine with all of its limitations, like professional ethics. Also, though, the healer meetings take on a bit of a Hearts of Darkness vibe as things go wrong and the other healers, particularly Atasie, question Chrissy's leadership. This is my first time co-facilitating and running a retreat with other healers, especially who I don't know. Trying to find the balance between being a second in command and being support and backseat driving. I'm angry and I'm upset with the world. And I defer to you, our wise leader, to name those things and then, you know, advise about how to... <laughs> Also, speaking of Chrissy, while this never comes up on the show, it's worth pointing out that she is a far-right conspiracy theorist. If you look her up a bit, you find out that she runs an Instagram page called The Mana Movement, where she used to post things like this. Humans are just as brilliant, diverse, and as colorful as the myriad species of birds in the jungle. The current attempts to homogenize us, to make us conform, to confuse our genders and make our intelligence artificial is a crime. The human fire and passion is growing. We will succeed in returning our earth to harmony. Hashtag natural justice. Hashtag no AI. Hashtag stop 5G. Hashtag nature. Hashtag Pachamama. Hashtag live strong. I say used to because that was before COVID. Now her posts are much worse. This whole charade has now been passed on from an IQ test amongst humanity based upon whether the survival rate of 99.7% makes a virus a pandemic or not, onto a crushing war on our civil liberties with frighteningly few on the battlefield. I don't care anymore whether you have drunk the putrid propaganda teat of the beast whether you have already or plan to contract with the beast itself by taking its mark. All I care about now is exposing the criminals that think we are too stupid to understand basic law. The ones that think a regulation holds any sway in court. The minions of the Masons that believe that a threat of a fine is going to make me roll over and play dead and very fucking dumb. Not I. And not my people either. We aren't scared of these threats because we know our rights and we plan to sue the crap out of any person or entity that thinks they can encroach upon them. We will win. 
Law is law. Nature is nature. And us love warriors aren't fucking having this bollocks. Hashtag not on my watch. Hashtag know your rights. Yo, sound off in the comments which putrid beast teat you suckled on, Moderna or Pfizer. Also, regarding how she always dresses like a wine mom who bought a racist Halloween costume, decided that she liked it and incorporated it into her regular wardrobe, basically the story there is that Chrissy traveled to Peru and studied under indigenous shamans in the Andes, who she also brings on to the show. That said, I do think it's a little weird that she now talks about her ancestors when she means the ancestors of her teachers. In my ancestry with the Mongolian medicine men and women, the shamans, they hold the drum like this and they bang it so fast. She actually does address this in a podcast that she did with her friend and fellow New Age practitioner Bilal Alwiti Kulker, who I bet based on that name you didn't expect to look like this. Billa argues that she thinks that it's fine for them to adopt other cultures' indigenous traditions because anyone whose ancestors weren't British Christians were oppressed by colonialism at some point. My ancestors are Norwegian, Swiss, Swiss Welsh, you know, the, the full run of European descendants. Christianity dominates our planet. It is the most you know, populous faith and it is completely tied in with geopolitical control yes. for the last 2,000 years. Agreed. So we all have a story with that mm. if we yes. live in a Western country. Yeah. And if you have Irish ancestry, you have exactly the same story as Indigenous people in Australia. Yeah. So this is wildly ignorant for a number of reasons, one of them being that Indigenous people in Australia are still extremely oppressed and discriminated against to this day in a way that Irish and Nordic people absolutely are not. If you're going to appropriate other people's Indigenous customs, first of all, don't. And secondly, you should at the very least be aware that their present day circumstances are wildly different than those of like someone whose great grandparents were Irish. But as bad as this is, Chrissy takes it one step further by arguing that the present day version of colonialism is people being made to feel ashamed for being white. The religious, religious spiritual control program that was put in, um, it's now the demonizing, I feel, goes both ways. So the disconnection from ancestors, but now the demonizing of self that can go on, not, not everywhere, but that can go on around having white skin or partly white skin. And, oh, well, then we must all be evil. There is a very subtle program that tells me I have no right because my skin is white. Mm. And I just want to expose that bullshit here right now as well because if I'm feeling it, I'm sure a lot of other people are feeling that. And that is another potentially even more subtle, more subtle program but even more powerful. Like the subtler they get, the more powerful they are. And I just want to blow that one out of the water. Man, wonder why they didn't talk about that on the show at all, eh? I wonder if the guests would be quite so trusting of her if they knew that like a year later she'd be performing smudging rituals, sending good vibes to everyone storming the US Capitol on January 6th. So once all the guests get to the retreat and unpack a bit, they all come to a meeting area where they go around in a circle learning each other's names and deepest traumas. I went through a lot as a child. I never am told. Christine, my childhood, it was worse than Mommy Dearest. There were some very cruel things done to me by my mother. Realizing how much my childhood and things that I went through as a kid have affected me now. I just feel like it's just been suffocated for so long. I just need to acknowledge it. Just a standard camp game, right? Okay, everyone take turns saying your name, your favorite food, and the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Also, one of the most fucked up things I've ever seen is that on this show, underneath everyone's name, they display what's wrong with them. And I don't just mean for that one scene, which would already be incredibly weird. No, that subtitle is there for the entire show. 
Also, a lot of the time, the issues under the guests' names really downplay the severity of what they're dealing with. For example, under Becca's name, it says spiritually disconnected. What actually happened was this. My son Gideon died at birth. Because of my chronic illness, um, it's dangerous for us to try again. I'm a pastor, but that kind of started a dark night of the soul. I just can't see God. For Miko, it says abandonment issues, which is certainly one way of putting it. I've been through a lot in my life, like foster care, being abandoned by a garbage can. I was just recently in a mass shooting. It just says codependent mother-daughter for both Robin and Christine, which I guess is true, but also Robin was so severely abused as a child that the show fully censors what happened to her. I'm writing you to help you understand your mom's past, my past. It will be an awakening to who your grandmother is. We endured things together that no one should ever have to go through. We were all playing invisible chairs just like kids do. Grandmother called her a liar. Probably the worst case of this is Claudia, who it just says has trust slash betrayal issues. Uh, but actually... I've had some family issues that are obviously very hurtful to me. A lot of the issues stem from the way I was brought up. I was molested by my own father. Finally, for Greg, it says anger issues, but the actual reason he's there is because when he was a kid, his brother was murdered by their babysitter. He was uh, murdered by our babysitter and strangled, and she was sentenced to prison for uh, 12 years, I think. Yeah, that seems less like anger issues and more like a vigilante origin story. Moving on, the next activity is the rage ritual, which is where they go to the meeting place to sit in a circle and take turns talking about their trauma, but angry this time. Honestly, come to think about it, basically every activity they do is just some variation on this. Also, for every activity or ritual, they put up this shitty looking graphic and Chrissy says how it's a super spiritual, traditional practice. This sacred rage ritual creates a safe place to feel rage and release. The ancestral fire ceremony is an ancient shamanic healing ritual with the rhythm of the drum induces a trance-like. Sacred orgasmic healing has deep roots stemming back to the ancient Egyptians. And, you know, sometimes it is. The ancient sweat lodge is an intensely challenging ritual of body, mind, and spirit. But also, some of them are really reaching. Cultures all over the world have been using frame drums. My favorite is when Atasia gets them all to dance. We're gonna co-create a fire circle. Move however you want, allowing this water to inspire you. But to introduce it, Chrissy says that actually, people may have been dancing for thousands of years. Some say dancing is practiced throughout human history in shamanism and even by the ancient Greeks. <laughs> Anyways, with the rage ritual, people are understandably pretty hesitant about doing what is a pretty weird and vulnerable thing in front of a bunch of cameras and people they've known for like two hours. So to get the ball rolling, Atasier gives a demonstration and it's just fucking wild. I am tired of you interrupting my ceremony, barging into my yard and telling me what I can and cannot do. Leave me alone! I have had enough! Just back up! Back all the way back! I, <laughs> I assume he's shouting at his neighbor or something and I'm just gonna be honest here, if his religious practices involve screaming about imaginary arguments that he's having, just like in his backyard or whatever, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to take the neighbor's side on this one. <laughs> Dude, just save it for when you're taking a shower like the rest of us do. So everyone goes around and does it. Uh, one person I thought was kind of weird was Becca. I'm so angry at you. You hurt people and you don't even care! Who, like, I think she's talking to God there? I mean, fair enough, I guess, but it's not every day that you see a minister just 
cursing the Lord. Another interesting part is Varon, who's very restrained when he does it. So I'm taking my power back from the sergeant that had me and my comrades arrested for doing a community cleanup. You brutalized us in front of women and children. Someone has police power over you or authority and they can do what they want to do and, and there's nothing you can do about it. That puts me in rage. And then Miko, who fully refuses to participate. Miko? I don't have nothing I'm angry about. Yes, you do. I, I don't. You are a human being in a human body right now, I child. promise you. Can I ask you a question, Miko? Is there anything in life that makes you angry? Like way, maybe way children are treated? Being taken advantage of as a kid yeah. makes me want to be there for other kids. Yeah. Well, but mate, I'm not. Yeah. Okay. I'm not angry about anything. Okay. okay. So what about your story, sweetheart? What about those, those things that you brought up in that welcome ceremony? Right. I'm just not an angry person. In both cases, the show presents this as them being emotionally detached, which they need to work on, and I imagine that to some extent that is true, but also, I feel like it's reasonable to think that those two specifically had a reason not to want to open up there. Even if they didn't know that Chrissy was Q-pilled, it's pretty safe to say that the show would have had an absolute field day with footage of the two black people losing their shit. Nine strangers. Y'all are so f***ing selfish. I'm really just like terrified. Those bitches better f***ing come at me with positive energy. At their breaking points. Ah! We'll come back to this point later, but I think it's worth paying attention to how, while the show absolutely does not address this, even on this retreat, not all the guests have the same access to therapies. Oh, also, this becomes important later. Miko and Baron are super into each other and couple up really early on. Finally, the last person to go up is Christine, whose issues stem from her dysfunctional relationship with her mother, who is going to be sitting about 10 feet away from her while she does the ritual. I have no idea what's about to come out of me right now, and it may be something that I can't come back from. It may even more so devastate my relationship with my mother. I don't want this to be a situation where I just all over my mother. Also, just a quick side note, I've watched so many bad reality shows now that I'm starting to pick up things like the shitty generic music that pops up again and again. Like, in every reality show, that song always plays whenever a woman is going to do something mean, sexual, or both. It's always just like, I didn't come here to make friends, I came to fuck. You got the devil inside, boom, boom. <laughs> so awesome. Anyway, so I'm sure that group therapy, as well as even rage rituals, can have benefits to people. But I think that the fact that they made this woman, who's obviously extremely uncomfortable, do this in front of her mother and a bunch of people she just met on camera the first day they're there makes it pretty clear that Lost Resort has absolutely no interest in actually helping these people. Also, I just want to point out how creepy Chrissy is during this and throughout the whole show. Anytime someone's having an emotional moment, she seems to be really enjoying herself. <laughs> right in, right in. Keep going down, keep going in. <laughs> and while I'm not saying that Chrissy is physically nourished by negative emotions, I can't prove that, but this cliffhanger is how the first episode ends. <laughs> Personally, that made me feel pretty uncomfortable. Chrissy felt very differently, though. It, it really is um, a series that I believe will bring a lot of hope and a lot of entertaining. Like, it's hilarious. <laughs> the first episode, I was laughing so much. I thought it was really funny. Like, that definitely doesn't make her sound not like an energy vampire, right? And so, in the next episode, Christine does the rage ritual. I'm going to throw up. Yeah. Yeah? You want to throw up? And Robin is, as you might imagine, pretty upset. Your childhood is not my childhood. Go. Again. <laughs> we'll get into a bit more how Robin is not a great mom, but 
I do think it's pretty reasonable that she was upset, but everyone immediately starts rolling their eyes and like really going after her. Well, I know she seemed like she was having a panic attack. It's like, let the people have their f moment. That's like, when, it's about when, all that, of us. That's when you looked over there and you was like, Yeah. <laughs> Robin, I'm not into the whole, oh God, the drama. Oh, come here, look at me. Again, obviously a great environment for therapy. I'm sure she's glad that she went to this hippie retreat for some organic, free range, grass fed group bullying. <laughs> It's like, okay, someone wants attention. And then the big saying ritual feels weird. I'm just gonna call them activities from now on. The big activity for the second day is one where they all partner up and tell each other what their mask is or basically what defense mechanisms they use. This is, again, a pretty weird thing to have people do when they've just met each other. With you and your mom, like, I just was like, I don't click with them. The weirdest thing with this, though, is that Christine has a big revelation that her mask is trying to always seem perfectly put together. And so at the end of the activity, she runs to wash all her makeup off and swears to not wear it anymore because she's done with masks. Wearing makeup for me is the perfect representation of that mask. Which Chrissy thinks is really great. I'm not gonna wear makeup. I'm gonna be myself. I'm gonna speak my truth. It's true beauty. That's what I want. And like, cool, if you don't wanna wear makeup, you don't have to, but plenty of people wear makeup just because they like it, not because they're uncomfortable with themselves. Likewise, not wearing it doesn't mean that you're perfectly healthy. Also, for the rest of the show, Christine continues to wear makeup, so I don't know what the point of this was. By the way, at this point, we're still in the part of the show where I would say that things are going well. Get ready, because this shit is going to escalate quickly. The next thing they do is try to have the guests communicate with the spirits of their ancestors. What this means is that they all stand around a fire blindfolded while people play drums and Chrissy talks them through a guided meditation. We're going to give you a blindfold and I'm going to take you through a, a guided meditation. But the thing is that I think Chrissy was just using a generic script since she tells them all to visualize holding hands with their parents and grandparents. You become aware that your mother is approaching you. You can see a canoe and in it is your father. This is a pretty fucked up thing to do since the majority of the guests had extremely traumatic childhoods. Like, Chrissy is at this point completely aware that three of these people were severely abused by their parents, but couldn't be bothered to change anything to accommodate them. I'm mad at you for beating me with two by fours. Your father, and you see in his eyes his experience. So the people who had healthy-ish childhoods didn't really get anything at all out of this. Whereas the people who didn't have extremely intense experiences. Greg is especially freaked out and like tries to get away from everything. I feel like I just had the biggest fight with someone of my life. It's all just coming in at every angle. I can't do anything about it and feelings and I need it to stop. Luckily though, Chrissy's there and she notices that Greg's getting really overwhelmed and so she gets in close and shakes a maraca next to his ear. I'm still struggling and I can't take it. I just wanted to take the blindfold off. Boy, you know, whenever I get stressed out, it really calms me down if there's a sudden, unexpected percussive instrument just somewhere in my personal space. Afterwards, Atasye, who is the only healer who thinks that there was anything wrong with this, I noticed a few people having real strong reactions. There was several people who kind of almost seemed to shut down or got like overwhelmed, too much sound, too much heat. Confronts Chrissy about it, who claims that she had everything under control. The ceremony unfolded in a way that has me personally questioning what are protocols that we might want to set up around ceremonial practices that ease people in a little bit more. I don't think there's any danger at all in what happened yesterday. I feel good. 
it's like, you know, like I always just think that all paths lead to God. And importantly, I don't think that Chrissy is bullshitting here. Throughout the show, she makes it very clear that her goal is to trigger the guests. And when I say that, I'm not using that word to mean pissing someone off online, but like trying to activate people's traumas in order to put them into an intense state of emotional distress. And you might think that this would lead to all the guests distrusting or feeling unsafe around Chrissy, but very much the opposite happens. The worse things get, the more the guests come to trust and rely on Chrissy completely. Can I talk to you now just about yes. the film? What was happening? What did you see? What did you sense in your ancestors? Uh, 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 they all came. Greg, that was so powerful to come up to me immediately and go, I need to talk this yeah. out. Miko has been through such horrific experiences and I understand that, but I need to use tough mama love to lay down the law. It's not cause I'm mad or punishing anyone. I didn't see no one coming to hold my hand. Is it that they didn't come or you didn't want them to come? They didn't come, yeah. And like, I wanted them, like I wanted to fill a hand. Beautiful. And I would love for you, Miko, just to feel into that over. How do I feel about wanting love, but not being able to necessarily have it? From here, things get worse, because it's now time for Chrissy to introduce the new healer who's going to be joining them, a woman named Aqua who practices sacred erotic healing. When Chrissy announces this, Atasier's response is very funny, as well as completely correct. It concerns me that we would bring a sexual healer into our midst. There are a lot of dark healers in that realm. Bringing Aqua in feels wrong to me. And yeah, this woman is satanic. Aqua is the physical manifestation of a bad Molly trip at a music festival. The flight from Taipei to LA in the Pacific Ocean, we entered in a storm. And the plane was like that from going like this. Like I feel the panic in the plane and I'm like, it literally just enveloped the whole plane and golden light and so I was like, you can't scare me, I'm going. The first thing that she does is lead a workshop meant to teach the guests to connect to their sexualities. I know that sounds pretty weird and uncomfortable, but let me just say that if you've never been to something like that, those kinds of classes are nowhere near as weird or scary as you'd think they are. Unless they're taught by Aqua, in which case they are exactly that bad. Let's all just hold hands for a minute. Now I want you to take the right hand down onto our yoni, our lingam, our genital. The guests are understandably pretty uncomfortable, especially Christine, who's there with her fucking mom. I felt also a lot of awkwardness. I was worried about my daughter. Yeah, the funny way of showing it, girl, you were like. <laughs> So that's the first part of the workshop. For the second part, Aqua has them all pair up and sensually touch each other. She decides to pair herself up with Varon, who she's been flirting with pretty aggressively since she got there. Varon, you know that you work out too. I do want to get into a routine though, where like I sleep early and get up for sun sunrises because I really want to see the sunrise. I want to see if you can read something in the other person's eyes. This leaves Miko without a partner, so she just has to sit there and watch a woman who's supposed to be healing her, feeling up the guy that she likes. We're just connecting. You can let go and just have some fun and you can enjoy the pleasure that that is. Let's just all connect our energy. This is not sexual, this is just sensual. Don't worry though, Chrissy notices this and decides that Miko and Varon being a couple is a problem because it'll get in the way of their healing and so they should be broken up. Clearly, Miko had no interest in getting in touch with her sensuality in the shadow of Varon and Aqua. Of course, everyone's noticed the sparks between Varon and Miko, but a budding romance just isn't the most ideal thing right now. It's going to distract them from the inner work they came here to do. She does not have any problem with Aqua flirting with one of her patients, though. In what, as you can imagine, is becoming a bit of a theme by now, Atasier tells Chrissy that he doesn't think it's a good idea to do a sexuality workshop when so many of the guests have sexual traumas. There's so much sexual scarring trauma. I feel like, okay, this is just another version of kind of what I was trying to speak to this morning. Chrissy tells him that it's actually fine and that she needs him to be unquestioningly loyal to her. Okay, well, it's happening. 
So whatever it looks like, I don't care. What I'm looking for is trust. Don't even get into it. He needs to trust me. Cool. Very cool. This is good. So at this point, I'm about to describe episode five. The reason I'm telling you this is because if you watch just one episode of this show, make it this one. In this episode, Aqua gives Becca a one-on-one -on -one Reiki session. For anyone who doesn't know, Reiki is like a massage, except instead of actually touching you, they just move their hands around you and like massage your aura. As a side note, when I was in university, there was a Reiki club at my school who'd give free massages so that members could practice. I never did it, but I always wanted to go to one with like a fake blood packet in my mouth and just halfway through the session start coughing up blood like, WHAT DID YOU DO?! What I'm saying is that I don't believe in Reiki and am a bad person. After Becca's massage, Aqua tells her that she's received messages from the spirits and then does a very obvious hot reading. For anyone who doesn't know, a hot reading is when a fake psychic will use information that they've gotten about the person that they're talking to to make it look like they have supernatural powers. We can see an unbelievably obvious example of that here. Aqua knows that Becca's baby died and that she's a minister, but acts like the spirits are telling her these things. The first word that just came as soon as I put my hands on your, on your head and, and your heart was faith. Mm -hmm. When you were pregnant, was there any moment in which you were not sure if you were going to have this baby? Yeah. The term hot reading is meant to distinguish this from cold reading, which is when a fake psychic has no prior information about their mark and instead gets their information by observing things like the person's clothes and appearance, as well as by using deceptive phrasing to make it seem like they're predicting things that the victim is actually unintentionally telling them. We can see Chrissy doing this here. What is that? What are you feeling now? Killed. Guilt, yes. I could sense it. Anyways, after Aqua senses the word faith from beyond the veil, she tells Becca that she's communicating with her dead son and that he says that it's her fault that he died because Becca didn't have enough faith. You were a pastor and yet you weren't having faith in yourself, in God, in the miracle. The only way that you can have that miracle is by having faith. I got a message from your little boy and it was, please have faith. Becca then explains to Aqua that she has a serious chronic illness that makes it impossible for her to get pregnant again without putting herself and her baby in mortal danger. When you have mast cell disease, there's a 50-50 shot that the kid will have it, and usually when it's passed on, it's even more severe. I feel like you still ask yourself whether you're going to have another child. You just haven't wanted to, or...? No, I just don't want to die giving birth. <laughs> or have another child die or pass on a disorder that could disable them for life. And then Aqua says that Becca's dead son wants her to keep trying anyways. There have been so many stories like this out there that people have been told they can't have children, not normally, whatever, and yet they still do. There's only one way to have faith is by testing it. It is amazing that this woman was able to take something that is already very evil and make it so much worse. Like, even if she'd chosen to give Becca some closure or comfort, she'd still be taking advantage of a grieving parent and using a dead child to further her career. But she couldn't even do that much. I'm not a therapist or a psychic, so take this with a grain of salt, but I'm pretty sure that even if you're staring at a small ghost who's telling you to tell his mom that it's all her fault, you should still definitely just say that he loves you and says not to blame yourself. That's a fucking layup. For her part, Becca reacts unbelievably calmly to this. I struggle with that because I think a lot of times um, <laughs> con artist healers use you don't have enough faith as a way of getting out of the fact that a miracle didn't occur. Holy shit, that is for sure the nicest way that she could have possibly told Aqua to keep her son's name out of her goddamn mouth. Aqua does not take the criticism very well. Chrissy winds up talking to her about it and saying that she needs to make sure that the guests feel heard, which is a pretty generous way of describing the problem with what Aqua did there. So she says she's absolutely made a decision not to have biological children, right. right? And when she shared with me what you were saying, she didn't really feel heard. Aqua instead blames Becca, saying that the reason she reacted badly was because she's a Christian. Hang 
one second, I want to come right to that point. So I said, a big part of your work is faith. There's a lot of preaching of faith. Yes. But a lack of embodiment of the faith. She got a little triggered and called me a con artist healer. To someone who's a strong religious pastor, the work that we do is voodoo. Now, I realize that there's a lot of worse stuff going on with what she just said, but I do also want to point out that Voodoo is an actual religion, and in fact, a religion whose practitioners Becca would have probably been way safer talking to. Anyways, Aqua tells everyone that she very much disagrees with Chrissy and Becca, and that she believes that her clients feeling seen or being safe is far less important than her expressing herself however she sees fit. When I got some feedback today that was trying to test my faith, the universe said to me, believe in your abilities and you know what's happening. I get that we have to be gentle with everyone, but I had to deliver that hardcore message that wanted to come through knowing that it would sh trigger and shatter a lot of things that were there. You can be authentic to your values, which is being honest, or you're going to sugarcoat it like because that will trigger and that will bring up shit. I may not be the perfect healer or person for someone, but I have a medicine and that medicine will touch you no matter what. I'm just channeling what needs to come through. That's my role. I'm a freaking channel. And then there's no consequences. Aqua's back teaching classes in later episodes. In fact, she definitely runs way more than a Tossier. So then, we're still talking about episode 5, by the way, there's the B-plot where Miko eats antifreeze, which... Whom among us, am I right, folks? Yeah, have fun criticizing Miko for her antifreeze snack from the comfort of your glass house. I should probably specify that while at this point it wouldn't be at all surprising if the show started intentionally poisoning the guests, Miko does it by accident, which is admittedly a hilarious thing to do. So Becca has a cooler that she keeps her medicine in with a bunch of ice packs whose labels are all in another language. I would still say that pulling a strangely labeled blue thing out of someone's medicine bag and eating it is straight up raccoon behavior. but. Also, to be fair to Miko, I do have to admit that that does look a lot like a freezy. Scissors. Tastes weird. As you may or may not know, antifreeze is not good for you, and so Miko is feeling horrible by nighttime. At dinner, word gets out that Miko ate poison, and so everyone makes fun of her. If anybody has extra, like, um, household cleaners or antifreeze in their rooms, Miko, uh, she gets hungry. She ate an ice pack today. <laughs> At what point did you say, I should stop? I should stop. Unfortunately, while antifreeze lowers the freezing point of water, it does absolutely nothing to protect you from sick burns. This is so fucked up though, right? Like, admittedly, eating antifreeze because you thought it was a popsicle is a very funny thing to do, but you at least wait till you know that she's alright before you start joking with her about it. Also, the jokes that they're telling are really unfunny. You were like, this doesn't taste like the blueberry I thought it was gonna taste like. <laughs> This doesn't taste like blueberry. <laughs> All I'm saying here is that I can understand denying someone urgent medical care for a good joke, but not these. Also though, like I said, dinner is probably the guest's first meal of the day while they've been drinking since noon, so things always get so fucked up at night. Like, during that sexuality workshop, one of the activities that I didn't mention is that they all had to list things that they liked about their bodies and then one thing that they don't like. I like my eyes, I love my boobs, they're great. <laughs> and I have nice fingers, so I like my fingers. Is there any parts of your body you don't love? I hate my hips. And then Aqua would make them half-heartedly say that they love that part of their body, thus curing them. Do you love your hips? No. I love my Fine. hips. I love my hips. Can I just sit down a little bit? Damn, I guess body dysmorphia is no big deal, actually. When it gets to Robin's turn, she says that she hates her ass, which pisses Miko off because... Honestly, I hate my bottom. Yeah, I, I have a butt. I'm 0.03% Guyan. I love it. I have my hereditary stuff done. And so Miko does the only sensible thing, which is drunkenly confronting her. Be your... I am myself, babe. Be yourself. You wear your glasses, you have no makeup on. You don't like your face. I think your face is beautiful. I'm not gonna take off my glasses one minute and be like, yeah, look. 
So anyways, after everyone's done roasting Miko, she heads back to her room to puke and they call a medic to treat the epic burn she got! Also the poison. Also, I'm sorry, this exchange is hilarious. Hi Miko. Hi. Did you start off? Yes. Anything that you have eaten that it's out of the normal? Antifreeze. So a couple of things happen while Miko's puking. For one thing, Claudia, who's roommates with Miko and Becca, and whose whole thing is talking down to everyone and giving them really bad unsolicited advice. How grateful we really should be for our bodies. It's about loving all the gifts that this body gives to you. You are healthy. Except I'm not healthy gifts. and my body fails But you're me. healthy enough to be here. Yeah. That's something to be grateful for. That's true. She comes back to the room and gets really mad because she sees this as Miko throwing a temper tantrum. In general, Miko seems to make a really big deal in a very dramatic show about any little simple thing. That can get really annoying. I do not condone people yelling, screaming, cursing, slamming doors, and then making a big scene. I'm not into the drama, so quote the F up. Listen, I get being annoyed at your roommates for silly stuff, but this woman is having a medical emergency and you're pissed that she slammed a door? Ugh, my roommate sucks. She's always slamming the bathroom door and then staying in there for hours, puking her guts out, having her friends with those weird blue uniforms coming over while their cars are blasting that shitty music. It's all like, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. All night long, it, it sucks. This is actually kind of everyone's attitude, by the way. When she's feeling better, Miko wants to get the fuck out of there, which is absolutely the right call. And everyone calls her a drama queen? My take on it is that it's really easy to upset Miko. Something that's really creepy here is that Chrissy gets Veron to take care of Miko. Not because he's a trained firefighter and so is probably at least as qualified to look after her as the onset medic is, but instead to pressure her into staying in the grossest way imaginable. Why don't you come chill out where it's cool at, at least? Until somebody get here. My room is cool. Yeah. Wanna do that? No, don't escape this cult and get proper medical treatment. You're so sexy, ah ha ha. But yeah, this is just unbelievably gross on the part of Chrissy. Like, she's been trying to break up this couple, except the second Miko is threatening to leave, then she immediately brings out Veron to pull on her heartstrings. Veron, just sit with us, sit with us. And then like a day later, once things cool down, she's right back to wanting to separate them. Got a beautiful connection, I understand that. That Veron's not able to be in his lane, focus on his journey. He's preoccupied with how Miko's going and she's sort of depending on him. But anyways, Miko decides to stay at least until morning, and then the next day, Chrissy and Atasier meet with her to aggressively pressure her into staying. It's just probably better if I leave. Yeah. Is that a decision you've made or you're feeling No, torn? I haven't made a decision. It will exhaust you being torn and it exhausts us. I would really appreciate it if you could make a decision by the end of this conversation. This whole part is unbelievably uncomfortable. When the ultimatum they give her doesn't seem to work, they start telling her that she's a burden on everyone who loves her. Anyone you love, when they're carrying a burden, you feel it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know you do. Now it's the same thing the other way. People that love you are feeling your burden. Ultimately, Miko decides to stay and then they immediately proceed to love bomb her. You gonna stay? Mm, yeah. Yeah! Meanwhile, everyone else has a meeting to get out any of the drama from last night, and Claudia goes off on how childishly she thinks Miko was acting. I want everyone to understand that whenever I, I share anything, I come from a place of love and compassion. But for the record, I personally didn't come here to deal with temper tantrums. Like, that's what you do when you're a child, and you don't know how to use your words. And I'm sorry. Eating poison because you thought it was a popsicle is a thing that children do, so she does have her there. But again, Claudia is only mad at Miko for like slamming doors or whatever. Then Christine, who by the way was the only person at dinner who instead of making fun of Miko actually helped her to her room, stands up for her. In the past, I've had situations where I thought that people were my best friends in the entire world and I could tell them everything. And then I found out they were going and making fun of me. And then later tells Miko that Claudia was talking shit. I've just noticed that Claudia 
has. Something to say about everybody when they're not around, and like, that's not cool. One of the people she talks about the most is you. This really pisses Claudia off because she insists that what she said was supposed to be confidential. First of all, the intention of the girls that went with the gossip, they disrespected the sanctity of the confidentiality of that integration circle. So that's bullshit. I really don't think that that's a thing, especially because everyone except for Mika was there. Claudia deals with this by going to Chrissy to complain about Christine. Do you have a moment with me? Of course. Thank you. Yes, come, sweetheart. It came to my attention. They went to Miko and said, you better watch your back because Claudia's out to get you. What? <laughs> oh, God. Lord, give me the patience yeah, yeah. to understand. This kicks off the final arc of the show in which everyone turns on Christine, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that ever since Aqua arrived, Ben has been incredibly into her. I think Aqua brings some of that liberated wild woman nature into her work. It's like, bah, fire, wild. She's definitely an attractive woman and she's like very fiery and like I do sexuality and, or and orgasmic dance. Beautiful, amazing. Um, she is fantastic. Since they're both living in the same tiny place, the two of them wind up flirting in extremely gross ways. Drums. Can I touch it? Absolutely. I use my sexual energy to manifest, create my dream life. That beautiful music, wow. I intentionally use this sexual energy, which is so powerful. It starts creating everything that I want. I guess, if nothing else, one positive of this show is that it does at least answer the question, what's worse than a guy who pulls out an acoustic guitar at a party? A guy who pulls out a steel drum. This whole thing is so much grosser though, because Onika is also living with them. <laughs> Throughout all of this, this grown woman has to just be like, yeah, whatever. Can someone please do the dishes? He's saying that he can't sleep, he's got insomnia. And I'm like, can you just need a really good <laughs> Aqua winds up falling hard for Ben, who does not feel the same way. I know that he wants to open up sensually, sexually. Even in his affection, he's very close and he doesn't realize it, but he started to realize it through me. Aqua brings some of that liberated wild woman uh, nature into her work. You know, I was about to start menstruating, so I was on full fire. Honestly, sometimes fine, sometimes too much. Definitely not a huge surprise since Ben definitely gives off some massive fuckboy energy. When I was younger, I used to be like, I'm this Viking guy, I can walk into a room and turn heads, you know? That was a thing that I like valued. Just to get some, you know, hindbrain pledge. What would this body have been doing 25,000 years ago? It's like, well, on the regular, I would, I would be engaging in sexual activity. Wait, you're telling me this guy isn't ready for a committed relationship? Not even if it's with an evil witch? That said, he also says how it's unprofessional for them to date while they're there, which is correct. I'm really not trying to look for anything that would jeopardize my work here and draw me out of my path. And then basically says that he can't date anyone because he's committed to the Volcel lifestyle. I spent the last several years discerning like what is right and what is not for me. Right. And I do not think we are meant to do anything. I have chosen for the last three years to cultivate my path and where I'm going, and I'm very disciplined with that. No fap king over here. Aqua takes this badly. Like, banging on his bedroom door yelling that she loves him badly. You know I love you, right? I support you. One million percent. I'm just saying I support you one million percent. Whenever they're alone, she talks about how horny she is. I'm just feeling a lot of stuff in my body. My whole body was just like energetically like on fire for about an hour. So Ben sets down some extremely clear boundaries, which she completely ignores. It felt distracting from my purpose of being like, you're here to heal people. Oh man, don't go into all this crap. Just be, crap. just be. Unsurprisingly, Aqua decides to see Ben not being down as him needing her erotic healing, meaning that it's actually her duty to completely ignore his boundaries. I intimidate him a lot. I am the wild that he wishes to embody. Yeah, I don't think that that's why he's afraid of you. She keeps saying that he's a scared little boy. 
Deep down there's a little boy inside of him who's just like still struggling with himself. Me and Ben had a disintegration a little bit, um, which is sad. But deep down there's a little boy inside of him who's just still struggling with himself. I feel like this should go without saying, but if you encounter a scared little boy, the correct response is absolutely not to pressure him into sex. Now, I haven't talked much about Thea yet. She's there because of the marital problem she's having with her husband Brandon, which is basically that they don't really like each other very much. My husband never let me talk about my childhood, like he didn't want to hear about it. We took a break and I started to, in that time, develop feelings for someone that I had known for a long time and I felt guilty about having sex outside of marriage. Most of the times that I've gone back to Brandon, it was guilt driven. He talked to my family, then they'd come to me and tell me how he loves me and he cried to them. Brandon isn't at the resort initially because he couldn't get time off work, but shows up halfway through and Thea is not at all into it. What's up, beautiful? Do you here for the rest of the time? The whole time. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, would you look at that? The whole not being able to get time off work thing is apparently incredibly on brand for Brandon, and a lot of their marital problems come from him not being around, like, to an absurd extent. The disconnect for me really happened when we went on a cruise, and I didn't see him, like, the entire cruise. I just love the image of Brandon escaping from the cruise by commandeering a life raft and then paddling across international waters because Sundays are for the boys by any means necessary. The funniest excuse he makes for not spending time with his wife, though, is that he's constantly at the gym. He was never home, always with his friends, didn't want to be intimate. And then it became the gym. He would go early in the morning, then go to work, and then go until like 9 o'clock at night. The reality is I had a lot of stuff going on. I was going to the gym a lot. It's been a rocky road. And I'm scared up here, if I can be honest with y'all. And I bottle up everything, go to the gym. Even at the resort with his marriage falling apart extremely publicly, he'll still just be like, oh, I need to go think about this at the gym. I gotta go. You gotta go? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't run away from your problems on a treadmill, Brandon. The reps you should have focused on were the ones spent uplifting Thea. In the end, he spent so much time focusing on curls that he forgot all about the girls. His wife and daughter. This part isn't actually very interesting, even though they do fully end their marriage on camera. So, are you saying that you're done? Is that what you're telling me? I'm... I feel like, yeah. What do you want to do? Like, I don't want to make it a big thing. I want us to just, like, go through what we yeah, need to do and I... people can find out as they find out. Did you ask him to leave or did he decide to leave? No, he, he decided <laughs> to leave. Yeah, he needed to leave to get back to the gym. One thing that is kind of weird with this part, though, is how Brandon acts with the rest of the group while he's there. So at this point in the show, they're really concerned about how much drama and gossip there is. The gossip that is threatening to destroy our retreat. It's distracting everyone, and I need to nip it in the bud. Except, you know, not enough to actually do anything that would change that. And so they do an activity which couldn't possibly backfire in an environment that's been intentionally cultivated to make everyone hate each other. They all pair up and then write down all of their issues and insecurities. The idea is that they're going to burn them in a fire that night, but first they share what they wrote with their randomly assigned partners. So later, Christine comes back to her room and sees Brandon and Robin talking, and as soon as they see her, they leave to talk privately. And she's got resentment, she just... <laughs> Hi! So Christine then tells Thea that her mom is having a secret conversation with her husband. I saw Brandon and my mom talking. I walked in yeah. on Brandon saying, do you still think that there is a chance? And my mother basically saying, shh, and then they walked out. Thea then finds a letter written to her by Brandon that perfectly lines up with everything that Thea wrote down and shared with Robin. This turns into a massive fight where everyone decides that the main problem in all of this was that Christine told Thea what she saw. Christine came in at some point during this conversation that Brandon and I were having, and I 
feel like she went back to Thea and that's where the drama started. All she was doing was telling the truth. She wasn't trying to start drama what or anything. Truth? That she saw through her own filters. I think she just repeated what she heard and saw. I know, darling, but what I'm saying is not everyone perceives the situations correctly. That's not love. Holding space for someone like that, Thea. I'm dying. Let her go. She doesn't want to be here. She doesn't want to show up. If she's very, very triggered, that's fine. That's her journey. People have tantrums. It's fine. And to be fair, sure, Christine didn't actually see that much, and it could easily have been nothing. But no one actually seems to care at all about that note, which does genuinely seem pretty damning. The thing Christine obviously forgot, though, was that Chrissy had said no more drama, not no more manipulation. And so Chrissy kind of just spends the rest of the show shitting on Christine, who fully doesn't understand why everyone's mad at her. All I want you to see is your responsibility in that situation. I don't, what, what is my responsibility? Over-dramatizing a situation. If you hadn't decided to go get involved, what happened last night could have been completely avoided. I just don't understand how, I, what I did was wrong. I really don't. I'm not talking about wrong. That's the second time I've said that. The rest of the show isn't that interesting. Chrissy has one-on-one -on -one sessions with everyone where she uncovers some deep-seated childhood issue which she uses to trigger them until they're crying, and she views that as them expelling the bad energy. It's honestly pretty fucked up to watch. That's it. Yep. Uh, That's it. Uh, Free with your body, whatever it needs to do. Yeah, it's just energy. You're releasing well. Keep going. It's all right. And then once that's happened, they're cured. Oh, actually, I said everyone, but the one person that Chrissy doesn't do that with is Miko, who instead talks to Onika, who basically just does yoga with her and then tells Miko that she needs to learn to love herself. And then Miko's like, yeah, true. Been like this forever, though. Like, I've always wanted to, like, self-love myself. Mm -hmm. I always felt like... It's okay that you don't feel it today. But it may come. And so then Miko's cured, too. So now, I'd like to wrap things up by talking a little bit about the way that Lost Resort views the problems that the guests are dealing with. One interesting thing is how Varon and Thea specifically are talked about. While I'm in no way trying to minimize the issues Varon is dealing with, his problem of not being able to open up and how it easily relates to his job is a lot simpler to understand and prescribe a solution to than others on the show who deal with much more complex issues. This is even more transparent with Thea. The show focuses a lot on her marital problems, which are a big deal, but also there's nowhere near the same emphasis placed on the extreme abuse she faced as a child. I think it's especially telling how Miko's one-on-one -on -one session gets so much less emphasis since her trauma stems from her having been failed by the American foster care system and more broadly dealing with the systemic violence of being a black person in America. It's obviously a bit much that all that she got was her yoga teacher telling her to love herself, but also Miko's issues aren't ones that you can just get over by crying them out. This is a really insidious part of Lost Resort, the inherent assumption that a person's environment, community, and material conditions don't play a meaningful role in their mental health. At one point, Greg says that he doesn't feel very angry at the resort because a big source of his anger is the homophobia that he has to deal with on a regular basis in his everyday life. At home, me being gay, I don't really feel accepted or supported, so my anger's constantly triggered. And instead of interrogating that or taking it at all seriously, Chrissy essentially sees that as him making an excuse and hiding the real issue, which can be fixed if she just gets him to cry. At one point, Miko fully says that all of these therapies won't do anything to change her material conditions, and Chrissy is basically just like, no, they will. But I still have to go back home where things are not all great. And, you know, that's not going to change by me being here. But it will help. This video was originally going to be twice as long, where the second half would dive into how this perspective is inherent not just to Lost Resort, but to the New Age movement as a whole, which itself has come to be the spiritual force behind neoliberalism. But... <laughs>
Man, the script is already almost 8,000 words, so I just decided it'd be better to break them up into two companion videos. That one's mostly written already though, so hopefully you should be able to expect it pretty soon. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching. Once again, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus an additional three months for free. Philosophy that